Lactose intolerance and dairy sensitivities are on the rise. This is especially true for those with gluten sensitivity. Now, it's no mystery that gluten can damage your GI tract, but gluten has also been shown to reduce the body's ability to produce the enzyme lactase. Lactase is necessary to break down lactose, the carbohydrate found in dairy. Inability to break down lactose can lead to gas, bloating, abdominal pain and discomfort, as well as flatulence. In addition, casein and whey, proteins found in dairy, have been shown to cause intestinal inflammation in up to 50% of those with gluten sensitivity. That's why I designed Dairy Shield. This premium digestive enzyme formula was created for those who struggle with lactose intolerance or dairy sensitivity. This comprehensive formula contains enzymes that support the breakdown and digestion of lactose and dairy proteins. The key ingredients in Dairy Shield include, number one, lactase, an enzyme proven in studies to quickly and efficiently degrade lactase while reducing associated dairy intolerance symptoms. And number two, protease, a powerful enzyme that supports the digestive breakdown of milk proteins while helping to maintain a normal immune balance in the gut. Now this product can be used in a couple of different ways. If you are lactose intolerant, take one to two Dairy Shield capsules about 10 minutes before consuming dairy-based foods to help support better digestion of lactose. If you're allergic to dairy, it's important that you understand that this product is not designed to help you eat dairy anyway. Food allergies should be taken seriously and avoided. That being said, the Enzyme Blend was designed to break down dairy proteins that you might be exposed to through cross-contamination of food or when eating out. Hence the name, Dairy Shield. Bottom line, Dairy Shield can help protect you from dairy cross-contamination and it can help support digestion of lactose for those with lactose intolerance. And like all of our products, Dairy Shield is gluten and grain-free, contains no artificial colors or flavors, and is formulated and bottled in the United States. Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We're going to be talking tonight about gluten and dairy and lactose intolerance. If you have struggled with dairy or maybe suspect that dairy may be part of your problem, you know, pay attention tonight. We're going to dive into some of the nitty gritty of why that might be. We're going to talk about the relationship between gluten and dairy, how they can cross react, and we're also going to be diving into how sometimes the only symptom of celiac disease can be lactose intolerance. So if you know somebody who's lactose intolerant, if you yourself have been diagnosed with lactose intolerance, you're not going to want to miss this episode. Now, if you're new to the show and you've got questions you want me to answer for you tonight when we get to the Q&A section, go ahead and start typing those in now. Generally, I try to answer those on a first come, first serve basis. And um, let, let's dive right in. It's the holiday season. A lot of you are traveling. A lot of you are being exposed to the dairy drama, right? You're being exposed to the dairy by eating other people's foods as you travel or as you visit families and relatives. Um, and, and so let's talk a little bit about what are some of the dairy dangers involved with people who are gluten sensitive. So if you're, again, if you're watching this show, the strong likelihood you already know you've got a problem with gluten. But many people go gluten free and they continue to consume dairy. And so we're going to just kind of do an overview. If you want a deep dive on all these topics, I want to encourage you to go watch my crash course on dairy as well. But we're going to really predominantly tonight, we're going to be focusing on this issue and why it's so important. But these are some of the dangers, again, involved in consuming dairy if you are gluten sensitive. Now, one of them is a lot of dairies contain added gums. And some of these added gums are very difficult to digest. So if your gut is already damaged as a result of years of gluten-induced damage and it doesn't digest very well, you're already struggling with digestive problems, 
to consume dairy with tons of added gums can be very problematic and cause a lot of indigestion and other issues. Now, a lot of your dairies too, a lot of your dairy products have added hormones. Many of these hormones is, uh, have been contributed to or have been shown to at least contribute to the development of leaky gut. So we don't need those when we're trying to recover from years of gluten-induced leaky gut. We know several dairy products contain a substance known as meat glue or microbial transglutaminase. We know that meat glue, there's some research studies that links it to gluten mimicry, meaning it, it can do the same kind of damage that gluten can do for some individuals. And then we also know that dairy in and of itself, particularly casein, which is the protein found in dairy, can mimic gluten. And this is why you hear a lot of people going gluten-free, casein-free diets, especially in the autistic community where kids are going both dairy and gluten-free as a result of gluten and casein having similar properties and cross-reacting. And then we also know there's something called BCM7 from A1 milk. Now, if you don't know what A1 milk is versus A2 milk, this show is, we're not going to go into the depths of that again. Go back and watch my comprehensive crash course on dairy to get that differentiation. But bottom line here is that BCM7 acts like an opioid. Um, and so it can create addiction. But the other component here is there's a linkage to autoimmune disease. So some people that react to this BCM7, it can actually induce and trigger autoimmune disease. The autoimmune disease it's both most commonly been linked to is type 1 diabetes. So, you know, you think about this, if you're a parent and you've got small children and you're wondering whether or not they should be drinking cow's milk from A1 cows with BCM7 in it, you know, you, you do have an increased risk for the potentiation of type 1 diabetes. And by the way, type 1 diabetes and gluten are genetically linked. They, they share the same genotypical patterns of risk. So these are all reasons why dairy can be potentially a problem. Now, some other things that I, I will just bring to your attention shortly is that cows eat grass. Okay, this hopefully this is not like rocket science brand new information. If you've never been to a farm and you've never seen a cow, then, might, then it might be. But cows eat grass. I hope that's not a news flash, right? Cows should not, and, and their staple food should not be grain. In essence, cows are not designed to eat predominant grain silage. So, but on commercial dairy farms, cows eat grain. And usually the grain that they're fed is used to what? To fatten the cows. It's used as a source of calories you know, on dairy farms to increase milk production. But unfortunately, this grain is loaded with glyphosate, pesticides, you know, unless you're using or organic, and then, and then, but we still have the problem of grain containing high levels of mycotoxins mold toxins um, that can, you know, you don't want those in your diet to any great degree. So we know mold and mycotoxins are a predominant source of grain. But, but we also know that many of these grains are GMO, meaning we've genetically manipulated them and now we're feeding the cow genetically manipulated food with mold toxins and pesticides. Where do you think this stuff ends up? It ends up in the milk and then it ends up in you, or it ends up in your child, or it ends up in your baby. And is that what you want as a staple food feeding your family? And that fundamentally, that's a decision you get to make, but it's a decision I would encourage you to make with these things in mind. Now, the other thing that we know is that cows eat grass. And so if you pump them full of grain, what has not been studied is does dairy from a cow contain gluten. Nobody knows. Why? We haven't studied it. What we have studied is we've studied humans and we know that, for example, a mother who's eating gluten and breastfeeding her baby, if her baby's gluten sensitive, she can pass gluten through her breast milk to that child. That actually has been studied. It has not been studied in dairy cows, the passage of gluten into humans who drink it. So 
But it is something that we, you know, we have this big question mark by, is this one of the reasons why so many people with gluten sensitivity do so poorly with dairy? And in my opinion, the answer is yes. This could be one of the reasons, along with all of these other factors, also along with all of these other factors as well that I was just talking about on this slide. Again, the meat glue, the added gums, the added hormones, the molecular mimicry, the BCM7, and then as well the lack haze uh, deficiency. Let's, let's talk more about what that means. Moving on here. So I, I want to point just a couple points of reference here. So this, was stud this study was published in the journal Digestion in 2005. You see the conclusion of this research was this, very important. A high prevalence of celiac disease was observed in patients with a positive H2 lactose breath test, meaning um, compared to healthy people. And these subjects, lactase deficiency seem to be, very important here, the only, and let's change that color, the only manifestation of celiac disease. In other words, these patients uh, had no symptoms, no GI symptoms, had no major manifestation of, of, of pain, et cetera, in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. The only symptom that they manifested as a result it was the fact that they were lactase deficient and couldn't handle dairy. So even, even you know, again, it's important to understand that you may not have a diagnosis. You may be on a gluten-free diet. You may not be on a gluten-free diet. You may not have celiac disease or you may have celiac disease. What this research is showing is that Sometimes the only manifestation of symptoms in celiac disease is lactase deficiency, meaning you don't tolerate the ability to digest milk. Now, I think it's important to point out the difference because a lot of you may be con confused about the difference between lactose intolerance and protein allergy from cow's milk. They're not the same thing. Very, very different. If we, if we very simply summarize what an intolerance is, an intolerance is poor digestion. They cannot digest. There's a sugar found in dairy called lactose. It's the predominant sugar found in dairy. And this lactose is broken down in the GI tract by your good bacteria, your friendly flora, break this sugar down into smaller substrates and many people lack the enzyme called lactase. So again, lactase helps to break down lactose. And if you can't do that very well or efficiently, it's called a lactose intolerance versus a protein allergy to milk protein which is an allergic response that leads to an immune inflammation. So this one leads directly to an immune inflammatory process. So immune inflammation is what we get from eating the protein. And again, the lactose intolerance, look at, look at, um, at, at some of these other statistics here. So you can see it's rare before two years of age. Okay, it generally occurs in the GI tract. It takes several hours after the consumption of the food to start seeing symptoms. Some of the common symptoms here are listed, nausea, vomiting, gas, bloating, diarrhea, abdominal pain, uh, borborygmi, which is basically like gurgling or rumbling in the GI tract, abdominal cramps. And um, diagnostically, these people have a positive hydrogen breath test, positive lactose hydrogen breath test. And some require dietary modification, meaning get off the dairy altogether. Some can do well with this if they add a, a digestive enzyme that can help break down lactose to their diet. Uh, we'll talk more in depth about that here shortly. Versus this cow's milk allergy protein, which generally, again, it's an immune system response. Any age of onset it can occur at, it's not just in children, it can occur in, in 30 and 40 and 50 year olds. It affects the gut, it affects the skin, it can affect the respiratory system. Really, this should say all systems, not just skin and respiratory. Less than one to two hours after ingestion, the symptoms can manifest. This is what we would call acute allergy, but then there's also something called a delayed allergy. 
And so the time framing of a delayed response is up to three weeks. So delayed response is a little bit different than acute response. Again, we, we add that to this diagram. And then symptoms, very common symptoms, rash, eczema, hives, edema, headache, wheezing, short, shortness of breath, anaphylaxis, skin prick test, and allergy testing are the diagnostic confirmations. Uh, but again, this is generally, these two generally um, are IgE. What's IgE is, is the acute response. Remember, we can do IgG, IgA, IgM, immune complex, and T cell response reactions as well. And that's what those are called delayed hypersensitivities. Not exactly the same thing, but they're still an immune response. And a lot of times what happens, people go get the skin prick or the allergy test for cow's milk protein allergy. Those tests can come back falsely negative because it's not that a person is not necessarily allergic to the, to the, or not allergic to the dairy, it's that they just maybe haven't been tested comprehensively for all the different ways they could be allergic to it. And I think that's a good point uh, that needs to be made if you're trying to figure this out. So again, uh, an intolerance is an inability or poor digestion of a sugar called lactose, whereas a protein allergy is the immunological or immune response to the protein aspect of the dairy. Either way, they're different things that can lead to different types of symptoms, but some of the symptoms have overlap. So if we, again, fundamentally, if we say, what is lactose intolerance? Lactose intolerance is poor digestion, right? So it's a reduction of the ability to digest or break down lactose into um, its, its, its smaller particles. And let's, let's show you what that, what that might look like here. Let's blow this up on the screen. So this is, a, again, this is published, just recently published in the journal Nutrients. Um, this study on, you see on the left-hand side, this normal lactose digestion here. And um, so you get normal digestion on that left side of the diagram where you take lactose here. Okay, you can see it looks like almost like two tiny stop signs that are connected together, two little tiny different shaded blue stop signs. One of those stop signs is made out of galactose, which is a, uh, is a, is a sub-sugar of lactose, and the other is made out of glucose. So you get one molecule of galactose, one molecule of glucose. A special enzyme called lactase breaks that lactose apart into those two individual molecules and then it enters your bloodstream and your body can use galactose and glucose as energy substrates so it can convert those into energy to help you digest your food. Then we have this right side of this diagram showing lactose intolerance which again is where lactose okay, is not properly broken down so there's, there's not enough lactase out here to do the job and so what happens is this lactose shows up in, this, in the large intestine of the colon and the bacteria, the massive quantity of bacteria in the colon will ferment that sugar creating gas as a byproduct and this is why that hydrogen breath test can come back positive because part of one of the byproducts of, of fermentation of this sugar is hydrogen, H2. That's what you see right here, H2. The other gas that you see here is CH4. That's methane gas. And this is, you know, this is, again, these are gassy byproducts as a result of fermenting sugar, right? If you ever made alcohol before, if you ever watched a TV show on how they make alcohol, what do they do? They take bacteria and they take sugar and that the bacteria eats up the sugar fermenting it and you get gas as a byproduct. That's why when you make it home, if you ever made your own sauerkraut or made your own ferment and it sits there in a jar, it's bubbling. What's it bubbling? Because these gases are being produced and they're pressurizing that lid and it's creating that bubbling effect. Well, the, one of the problems with this is if you get a ton of gas in your GI tract, you're going to get symptoms, right? That's the gas, the bloating, the abdominal discomfort, the diarrhea potentially, um, all those linked again up to not being able to break that down and having the bacteria in your colon instead of the enzyme in your small intestine breaking down that sugar, your bacteria have to actually ferment it. And remember that you know one of the byproducts too of fermentation that gets rarely discussed in biology with doctors is alcohol, right? So now, you know, what does alcohol do? It travels to the liver as well, and it can damage 
the liver over time. The more you have to use bacteria to ferment your food instead of actually digesting it with digestive enzyme power, the more potential for alcohol you have. There's actually a condition in humans called auto brewery syndrome, which is where you produce your own ferments of alcohol and it actually makes you drunk and you stay drunk. I've actually had, had patients walk into my office who were dizzy, who were jaundice, yellow eyes, yellow skin. I could have sworn to you they, would, they were inebriated or drunk, but they actually had a major problem, not just with lacto lactose and lactase, for example, but you see this is very common too when the GI tract is, has a yeast overgrowth. Yeast are also known to create this type of problem, even in the absence of lactose intolerance. When we come over here to this side, you see lactose maldigestion, malabsorption, and intolerance. You see clinical conditions leading to the diagnosis secondary hypolactasia, meaning basically leading to a, an inability, because there's a genetic version of, of having lactose intolerance, which is generally found much earlier on, but then there are what are called secondary causes. So these are other things that in life that can happen to us that can lead to us not producing adequate quantities of this uh, lactase enzyme to break down lactose. And one of them is severe malnutrition. This is, you've heard me talk about this time and again. This is why it's so important to measure nutrition status because certain nutrients are necessary, especially like zinc, to produce lactase. If you, how do we make lactase? Well, we make it in the brush border of our small intestine. So anything that damages that brush border can reduce our ability to produce that enzyme. But we also need nutrients to build that enzyme. We need protein and severe malnutrition um, can, can, can be a reason as to why a person will develop this issue. We know that celiac disease, as I showed you research a moment ago, that sometimes the only, only symptom of celiac disease is actually development of lactose intolerance. We also know inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, regional colitis. There are a number of different inflammatory bowel conditions that can lead to this diagnosis. We also know in addition that bacteria and viral infection in the GI tract, parasitic infection in the GI tract can also damage what? Can damage the brush border leading to reduction in the ability to produce the enzyme lactase that, that again, that breaks down lactose. Actinic enteritis. We also know certain pharmacological treatments. There are a few examples here, but some of these are antibiotics and some of these are chemotherapeutic agents. So we'll see this a lot in people going through cancer treatment. It's one of the reasons their guts can't, can't, uh, can't thrive super well is the chemo destroys the lining of the gut and reduces their ability to tolerate certain foods. This is one of them. We also know antibiotics. We could put antibiotics on this list as well. And then some post-surgical conditions, um, post-surgery, like short bowel syndrome. When you, if you've had part of your bowels removed, right, due to chronic, usually because of chronic inflammatory disease, um, you have short bowel, which means you have less space to digest your food. You have less transit area to digest that food and that can lead to intolerance as well. So again, these are all reasons as to why that can develop. These aren't the only reasons. We've got other ones as well. And one of them, as I mentioned earlier, is pesticide. Pesticides, when you're eating non-organic, just think about, you know, why is it so important to eat organic food? One of the reasons is to avoid these pesticides. What do these pesticides do? They're, they're antibiotics. Right, They wipe out our microbiome. What, what science has been discovering really over the last 25 to 35 years, more and more and more, we realize just how important the microbiome is, how much it helps protect you from disease, how much it helps to help you digest your food, helps your immune system recognize good from bad, helps you produce vitamins, it helps produce a substance that coats your GI tract and prevents it from leaking. Well, when you're eating non-organic every day, you're basically getting in low doses of antibiotics. You're destroying your microbiome, right? You're, you're reducing the capacity for your microbiome to protect you and function for you. And therefore, you're laying the framework or the groundwork for this disease. We know bacterial problems, whether it's infection or overgrowth, 
okay, here, or whether it's foods that you're eating that are creating imbalances in bacteria. We know gluten, for example, can create bacterial imbalance in the GI tract. If you haven't watched my Glutenology Masterclass, go watch it. I talk in depth about why that actually can happen. We know that medications, as I mentioned before, certain medications, particularly though antibiotics, as, as we were mentioning, but also we know there are other things that hinder digestion. Antacids are, are another example. Proton pump inhibitors um, as a class. H2 antagonists or, or histamine 2 antagonists are medicines that, you know, that reduce your body's ability to produce stomach acid, which are going to hinder your digestion. And that's going to hinder di not just digestion in your stomach, it's going to hinder digestion all the way south as well. There are other medications that we know can damage the gut. What damages the gut? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. You know, when your doctor tells you to take that aspirin every day for your risk of heart disease, that's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that's eroding the mucosal barrier of your GI tract, contributing to damage to your gut. We know that steroids, okay, oral steroids can cause the same kind of problem. And when you mix these two NSAIDs plus steroids equals a seven to tenfold increase in that damage, this is even more dangerous when you're taking both of these things simultaneously. Um, again, there are a number of medicines that we know can damage the GI tract. There's certain blood pressure medications that can as well, but point being, if you're relying on medicines to try to keep you healthy, you're, you're, you're barking up the wrong uh, philosophy tree, if you will. Medicines don't get you better. Medicines mask your symptoms so that you don't ever understand where they're coming from, but they just suppress them. And you, you do that for five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, you create massive quantities of damage. One of the things medicines can also do is they can cause nutritional deficiencies, but beyond medicines causing nutritional deficiencies, poor diet, processed food, you know, perfect example here, um, let's just look at an egg as, as an example. If you buy an egg from a standard commercial uh, egg producing farm where the eggs are, you know, all cooped up in tight pens, they don't get sunshine, they don't get exercise, they don't get grass, they're being fed predominantly what? Grain, right? Those eggs have two times less vitamin E, they have eight times less beta carotene, about two and a half times less vitamin A, and approximately two times less omega-3 fat. So just compare a pasture egg to a grain-fed commercial produced egg, look at how much less nutrition you get from that egg than you get from a healthy egg. This is one of the culprits behind nutritional deficiencies. When your cows are being fed mass production, GMO grains loaded with pesticides, when your chickens are being fed that, when your hogs are being fed that, when they're all cooped up and they're all you know, crowded in, in areas where they don't have room to breathe and maneuver, the nutritional density and the quality of the food deteriorates. We see the same thing. It's not just with animals, folks. It's also with the crops that are grown, the monocropping, the way our agriculture is done is you strip away the land and you add nitrogen to the soil so that things grow really fast. But when things grow really fast, they have less time to pull nutrients from the soil. And if the soil has been depleted because it's been over farmed, you have less nutrients to pull from the soil. We know today the way farming is done that, that produce Fruits and vegetables are less nutrient dense. We know that our animals and their byproducts are less nutrient dense. This is why it's so important that you support organic, you know, sustainable agriculture. And when I say sustainable, I mean done the right way. Um, there's this big, there's this big movement right now toward you know chasing cow farts and demonizing cow farts and demonizing animals in the way that they're grown. It's not the animals that are the problem. It's the in, it's the it's the nature of how the farmers are doing it, and it's not just the cows. It's also that GMO-grown soy and other plant-based products that they're using to make some of these processed foods, plant-based foods that they're calling healthy. So you got to keep those things in mind. Now let's talk more about some of the symptoms of lactose intolerance. So again, there's a laundry list here, and what we did is we took this is this is actually from the the journal Science Progress, and so. What they did is they, they did a huge thesis on, on the quantity of symptoms uh, that, that are related, like quantitatively, how many of, of the people that have lactose intolerance have certain kinds of symptoms. And so what you can see here over here is 
abdominal pain, 100% gut distension, 100% tummy rumbling, 100% flatulence or excessive gas. Then we have 30%, rather, uh, not 30, but 70% uh, diarrhea and 30% constipation, so constipation less common. Nausea, 78%, vomiting, 78%. And then we have other symptoms like headaches and lightheadedness in 86%, loss of concentration, poor short-term memory, 82%, chronic severe tiredness, 70 or 63%, muscle pain, 71%, joint pain and swelling and stiffness, 71%. A lot of people don't realize, you know, dairy intolerance can create a whole lot of symptoms that are not related to your bowels directly, right? I mean, this top list is mostly bowel, right? GI tract, this bottomless, headaches, poor short-term memory, chronic fatigue, muscle joint pain, development of allergies and mouth ulcers. Well, mouth ulcers go up here, but these other symptoms are not really linked to the bowel. So a lot of people would never even know their lactose intolerance. Why am I tired all the time? Why do my joints hurt all the time? Again, these are symptoms that are reported in patients that have lactose intolerance. We also get heart arrhythmias as, as a symptom you can see here. So, um, and, and then under allergies specifically, so when we talk about allergies here, we're talking about a lot of it is skin issues, right? So eczema, pruritus, but also allergies in terms of the, of the sinus cavity where you feel stuffed up. Okay, so what do we do? I mean, what do you, what do, you do if, you're, if you're lactose intolerant? You can get a diagnosis through a breath test if, if that's something that you really want to seek out. But you know, there's a there's a top list of strategies that I would suggest that you utilize and 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 do if you are lactose intolerant. Obviously, the first one is the obvious, right? Is don't eat dairy. Cut it out. Now, some people say, well, there's just no way I'm going to do that. We'll talk about a potential option for you. But I mean, if your body can't digest it, the best thing that you can do is to cut it out of your diet. And those of you who've read No Grain, No Pain, you also, if you get to phase two of that diet, you know dairy is, is, is something we cut out um, so that the body has the potential to heal. Remember that one of the things gluten does, gluten causes dairy or lactose intolerance. So if you cut out, sometimes what happens when you cut out gluten, if you cut it out, then if you're, you know, one of the things that happens is it improves your bacteria, it improves your microbiome when you cut out gluten, okay, it reduces immune overreactivity, it seals the gut, or helps to seal the gut from being permeable or, or over permeable. And one of the things that happens is your gut heals, right? So the gut lining starts to heal. And when the gut lining heals, guess where lactase is made? It's made in the gut lining. It's made by your brush border. So if this gut lining heals, then sometimes what happens is we start producing lactase again, and then we can develop a tolerance to dairy as opposed to an intolerance. This is a possibility. Now, there are caveats to adding dairy to your diet if you're on a grain-free, gluten-free diet. And one of the biggest caveats is you have to, if you're gonna try to attempt to add dairy back in, you've gotta add in healthy dairy. You can't add in junk dairy. So the dairy you add in has gotta be healthy. That, what does that mean? What does healthy dairy look like? Number one, my advice is it should be from A2 producing cows. A2, if you don't know the difference between A1 and A2, go look it up a, or go watch my master class on dairy. A2 um, refers to the type of casein protein in the dairy. Casein, A1 casein mimics gluten, A2 casein does not, so you're safer with A2 casein. Number two, it should be organic. Number three, it should be grass fed. The cows should be getting sunshine and eating grass, not, not shoved in a pen, eating grain all day with genetically modified nonsense in it. Like these three rules should be ideally followed. So where do you get something like this? It's hard to find this in the grocery store. This is where if you add all these up, you go to a local farm, you support a local farming community where they actually have A2 cows in their feed. If they feed any extra feed in the winter, it's coming from an organic feed source and that the cows predominantly use grass as their major staple in their diet. This is, these are the general 
rules if we're trying to find healthy dairy. Now, if any of one of these rules don't apply, it's my advice that you just avoid it altogether. It's not a good idea. But um, that's something that can be done, again, if the dairy is healthy. What some people choose to do is they choose to use dairy products. Uh, there's a couple of different major brands, and what they have in them is they have, basically, they've got pre-digested the lactose using lactase. Lactase, again, is an enzyme that breaks down lactose. And you can, you can use some of those products, but are they A2 milk, are they organic, and are they grass-fed? And the answer is I've never seen a commercially available product that fits those rules. You could, if you find a product that you want to use and you want to add, like, you could add lactase as a supplemental into your diet, and some people do this. Now, I will, say, I will say it, the same way I talk about gluten, there are enzymes on the market that degrade or digest or break down or help reduce uh, the protein peptide bonds in gluten, making it less toxic. It's the same thing here, the supplements that, uh, supplemental lactase that can break down lactose. Some people are severely intolerant. If you are one of them, don't do this. This is more along the lines of somebody who's supplementing. It's more along the lines for somebody who gets mild indigestion type symptoms associated with the consumption of dairy, especially if you notice if you can drink like a quarter uh, of a cup of something or eat a quarter of a cup of something, but when you go over that, it's like all bets are off in terms of bloating and gas and indigestion, etc. So for those of you with kind of a more mild issue, if you're, as long as the quality of the dairy fits the rules, you can use a supplemental lactase to help you break that down. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, provided, again, that it's not making you sick in other ways, provided you don't have all those other symptoms that I was talking about tonight that are also associated with lactose intolerance because if you're struggling with all those things you need to quit trying to keep the food in your diet and you need to get to the root of why you can't have it why your gut is so broken that you're incapable of properly processing digesting keeping it from spreading across your bloodstream through intestinal permeability or a leaky gut so again you can you can supplement lactase we, we actually have something called dairy shield which is rich in the enzyme lactase for this purpose the other thing that you can do and that you can supplement with that for many people find helpful, and actually let me go back because I want to show you, I, I skipped over a study that I wanted to show you, and that's probiotics. Probiotics, so if you look here in this particular paper published in Journal of Nutrition and Intermediary Metabolism, you can see there were, this was a review article, okay? So, so what they did is they took multiple different studies looking at predominantly at different strains of bifidobacterium, you see here bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, and they tested to see how people did when supplementing with these particular probiotics. And so what, what you can see here, supplementation of yogurt and bifidobacteria in lactose intolerant subjects modified the metab metabolic activities of the colonic microbiota and alleviates symptoms and lactose intolerant subjects. So again, alleviating symptoms. We see the same thing in this particular species is that it's, it's alleviation of some gastrointestinal symptoms and lactose intolerance. And down here with lactobacillus, chronic constipation and, um, and um, maldigestion in men with lactose malabsorption improved. l rutery shows positive association by reducing nausea, flat, flatulence, and diarrhea and lactose intolerance. Again, each one of these studies shows some benefit of using the different species of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. So this is just another avenue where supplementation... Now, I, I'm not a big fan of supplementing so you can do something bad for you. I'm more of a fan of supplementing for health so that you can restore your health so that what your body couldn't tolerate before you might be able to tolerate now. And this is one of those areas where dairy, in my experience, 21 years in a practice, clinical practice setting, I find that a lot of people can re-tolerate dairy once they've healed their gut, once they've healed the brush border from years of gluten exposure, if they introduce it properly. Meaning if you're gonna reintroduce dairy, 
those three rules that I mentioned earlier, the A2 milk, the organic milk, the, or the A2, the organic, and the grass-fed rules are, are very, very critical and very, very important. And if you're not doing it that way, you're running a risk of potential autoimmune reactivity through the casein molecule. You're also running a risk, if you try to add it back in too early, that you overstress the GI tract, which is already overstressed, and end up suffering indefinitely. So I hope that gives you some clarity around lactose intolerance versus dairy allergy, that you can be allergic to dairy but not intolerant to lactose. You can also be lactose intolerant but not allergic to dairy. You can also be both. Okay, so it's important too if you're making that decision of trying to add dairy back in in a healthy way that you clarify that you're not allergic to it because if you're allergic to it, no digestive enzyme in the world is going to help you overcome an actual allergic response. You need to avoid it. If you're intolerant to it, Again, is it a temporary secondary intolerance you know, caused by digestive damage over years, or is it a primary intolerance where you'll never be able to regain tolerance? That's something that you want to get clarity on so that you can make an intelligent decision about whether or not you want to add dairy back in to your diet as a source of potential food. Um, I mean, there are a number of other aspects around dairy we could discuss, but I think if we, if we get too deep into that, we'll run out of time, and I definitely won't have time to answer your questions. So let's Let's jump into those questions. Uh, let's see here. Question about diatomaceous earth. Do I recommend it for, for gut issue? Depends on what, what gut issue you're talking about. I mean, just generalized use of diatomaceous earth, not really. If you the, the biggest reason to take like a diatomaceous earth would be if you have a parasite or if you have um, if you have some type of um, toxin recirculating through your enteropathic circulation that you were trying to get diatomaceous earth to bind onto so you could get it out of your body. But you know, if you're just taking it for general gut health, that's not something I really recommend. Um, what can help during menopause? My hot flashes come day and night and make me feel bad. I would recommend some, some there are a number of different natural, um, they're called adaptogenic herbs, but they, they can be very effective and helpful and supportive of women going through menopause. We actually have something called women's formula that you might check out. It's a gluten-free formula with a number of adaptogenic herbs that for many women going through that change, um, it, it definitely helps get them through it. How regularly can you drink electrolytes in a day? Um, you know, you can drink electrolytes all day long. Yeah, it's it's really hard to overdose on electrolyte because I mean, unless you just overutilize the electrolyte. Now, if you're using my ultra electrolytes, kind of the rule of thumb with that product is you take a half a teaspoon for every 20 ounces of water that you consume. You don't need more than that. Drinking more than that, that's where you would get into kind of more of a trouble along the lines of creating dehydration instead of creating rehydration. Yeah, so questions about medicines, I can't really answer specifically because I don't, I just don't have enough information about the history. So if you've got specific medicine questions about drugs specifically, that's, it's really a challenge for me to answer those. Uh, would they put meat glue in camembert and brie? That's a good question. Um, I could see them doing it. I mean, remember what meat glue is. It's, it's used in cheeses. It's used in dairy products as a thickening agent. So, I mean, I, I would definitely look at the brand and make sure that what you're, what you're buying doesn't contain that or at least call them and make sure they're not adding, call the manufacturer of the product. Um, let's see, what have I found causes ocular migraines? Also, uh, ocular migraines very commonly can be gluten. There are certainly are other triggers. You might check out, we have a really comprehensive article on triggers for migraines, and that includes ocular migraines at Gluten-Free Society that you can read. But there are a lot of potential triggers. Gluten is probably the best and most well studied in terms of, of that particular problem. Why remove potatoes and tomatoes on the grain-free diet? So Pat, that's a good question. And it's not that we have to remove potatoes and tomatoes on a grain-free diet. We, we remove nightshades in phase two of the no grain, no pain diet. And the reason why we avoid nightshades in phase two is some people react to the compounds called solenoids that are in nightshades and it causes and contributes to chronic systemic inflammation. So for some people, we, we want to have them go through that trial period where there's an elimination before a re-addition of that food to see whether or not 
there's a reaction. Now, it's very different if you were to come to see me, for example, in my practice, we would actually test you for all those things. I wouldn't put you on a generic diet at all. We would actually, we would test out everything to see what you absolutely needed to avoid versus what was safe for you to consume. So it'd be very different. But remember when, when I wrote my book, and, and as many doctors do when they write their books, they, they're trying to generalize to help the most amount of people with that information as they possibly can. So those rules exist. Be, mainly because I was trying to generalize for the whole population without having the capacity to test every single person that was ever going to read my book. But ultimately, my advice is if you you really want to know, get get tested. Test, don't guess, because that's how you're going to get to the bottom of what you should or shouldn't be eating and be very accurate about it. I went carnivore last year, included cheeses I would break out in rashes, turned out to be dairy after the removal. Could it be the A1 casein or gluten in the cheese? You know, it could be any of the things that are wrong with dairy and the way that we produce dairy today. It's a really good question. I, I would say, you know, if you reacted in rashes, I mean, if you wanted to try to wait several months and try to re-add it back in, I would just follow those rules I, I gave you tonight on, on the type of dairy that you do add back in. And if you re still react to it, and you probably have a dairy reaction. Now, your other option is to just get tested and see whether or not you're actually truly allergic, have a protein uh, immune response. Um, let's see, what's gel and gum and locust bean gum? Can you consume those products if you have a gluten problem? You can, but the you know, problem with all the gums, any of the gums, no matter what the gums are, if you're new to the gluten-free diet, gums are hard to digest. And so if you're eating a lot of these processed packaged foods loaded with food gums as thickening agents to take the place of gluten, some people really struggle in their digestive tracts, really try to struggle to digest and process those gums. So a lot of people with, that are new to gluten-free don't do well with a lot of gum-based foods in their diet. So I'd just say word of caution, Linda, about how you go about that. Linda, too, I'd also encourage you, I, I have a really good article on all the different gums because some of them are definitely more toxic than others. Probably gelin is one of the better ones of the bunch, but it, you should go to Gluten-Free Society and check that article out. Let's see, Pat, I'm 150, 150 pounds, six foot tall, um, an athlete, started today on the grain-free diet. I'm nervous. How can I get all my intake just with veggies and fruits? I didn't see that you were a vegan in there. Are you, are you trying to be a vegan? Because, I mean, you can get plenty of food in there with meat, you know, organ meats, vegetables, fruits, and nuts. Very easy. There's a lot of calories in those things. So most grain anyway is, is empty calories the way people eat it, um, but but... Um, you know, again, again, unless you're going on a vegan diet, which can be a little bit more challenging, but even still possible to do no grain, no pain in a vegan way. Thoughts on dairy substitutes? Uh, I don't drink them, but they are popular. Soy, almond, flaxseed milk. You've got to be real careful with all of them. Make sure they're organic if you're going to use them. I wouldn't use them as staple foods in the diet. Uh, for example, soy milk well, most soy produced in the country is GMO soy, um, loaded with chemicals, pesticides, loaded with gum thickening agents. Also, sometimes they contain corn additives just in disguise. So you just have to be cautious around them. I just wouldn't use them as staples. If you had, had them every once in a while and if you pre-vetted the ingredients in them to make sure they were grain-free, I think you could probably get away with once in a while, but I just, again, not, not as a primary staple in your diet. Yeah, somebody's commenting about Holstein cows having more milk production than A2 Jersey. Yeah, I mean, so, so what's your point? I mean, they produce more poison for humans than A2s do. I, I would say that, you know, the, the argument is we want to use A2 Jersey even despite lower milk production. Remember, humans aren't cows, right? We're not baby cows, we're humans. And so the quantity of dairy that we rely on and depend on in this country anyway, and in most industrialized countries, is far greater than what it should be. Most people so lean on that dairy. I mean, the vast majority of the, of the world has huge, I mean, if you look statistically at, at how common lactose intolerance is, it's extremely common. The secondary type of lactose intolerance is, is more common than it is not common. So most people shouldn't be eating the quantity of dairy that they're consuming anyway. I, I think we would do good by converting our herds to A2 versus Holstein. Um, can unpasteurized milk carry salmonella? 
you got sal there's salmonella on most things that you are exposed to or come into contact with. It's not an issue of whether there's the presence of salmonella more than it's the issue of whether or not your immune system is strong enough to protect you when you do get some exposure. I mean, if we, if we cultured your gut today, we'd probably find that that degree of bacteria in you. All milks have salmonella. Even pasteurized milks have been shown to, to contain some salmonella in them. As a matter of fact, there's a trick in the dairy industry, in the trucking industry, if a if a if a, an eighteen wheeler full of dairy doesn't pass muster, this was actually this I knew a guy in the industry who drove a, a dairy truck. When, one of the tricks is if their if their dairy didn't pass the salmonella test when it got where it was supposed to go, they would drive down the road, pour Clorox bleach in the tank, and, and they would keep doing that until it passed the test. I mean, so what, what's actually in dairy to make it salmonella free, in my opinion, is far more harmful than salmonella uh, if, you're, if your gut microbiome is in good shape. Um, Grass-fed butter for a person with ulcerative colitis. Look, with, if you've got active ulcerative colitis, I don't recommend any dairy. If you've got any active inflammatory bowel disease, you should be avoiding dairy at all, at all costs. At least that's my experience. Um, to recover, recovery needs to come first because when you're inflamed, you're probably most likely going to be intolerant to that dairy regardless of whether or not you're allergic to it. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend avoiding it at least f until you get your, your condition, your situation, inflammatory situation under better control. Is an IgG test reliable? For f if you're talking about for food sensitivity, no. IgG tests are highly unreliable. Don't waste your money. Um, you, you really, you've, if you're going to do allergy testing, I, I, I keep, keep saying this, but I'm, I'm hoping in the new year we're going to have direct-to-consumer allergy and food sensitivity testing from a delayed perspective that is not inaccurate that you guys, that anybody can use that any, without a doctor's order. Um, but IgG testing is extremely unreliable and there's a huge prolific um, false positive rate on those types of tests. How do I feel about kombucha? I don't like it. I think it's basically, I think it's sugar water that produces alcohol as a byproduct that people have labeled as healthy. I think it's junk food. Um, let's see. How helpful do you think a celiac disease panel would be? It depends on the methodology of the panel. If you're trying to identify whether or not you're gluten sensitive, Robert, I think the only panel that you should be concerned with is genetic testing. Let's put a link in for genetic testing for Robert. Um, you can go read more about it. Genetic testing, because the other tests, they're highly unlikely to give you an accurate information unless, unless you're so sick, unless you're, I mean, generally those, those antibody tests for gluten don't show up positive until the illness is so far progressed that, that we don't want to find out that late in the game. We want to find out early in the game. I'm in need of vitamin B5, but the vitamin B5 that you have at Gluten Free Society is out of stock. Can you tell me what brand you would suggest? I would just use our B, our B Complete instead as a, you know, as a, as a gap, as a stop gap. It's got, um, it's got a pretty heavy dose of vitamin B5 in it, higher than what most B complex vitamins have. How does the stomach digest street drugs? We've got to be more specific, Michael. Um, what kind of street drugs, which, you know, what are you talking about? And, you know, that the other problem with street drugs is that, you know, at least with some of the brand name pharmaceuticals, you know what's in the product. Street drugs, you've got no idea. So, I mean, it's kind of one of those things where all bets can be off, unfortunately. Um, let's see, keep going down on that left side. Oh, okay, well, I'm sorry, yeah, eggs, question about eggs. Where do you suggest we buy eggs and what brand? Um, if you're buying them from the grocery store, look for free range. Uh, I think there's a, a company called Vital Farms. They carry a really solid brand of egg or a good brand of egg. Um, but you want to look for free range organic and pasture raised. All those terms are important. Um, outside of that, find a good local f farm to market, you know, like, a, like a, um, a, a farmer's market type of place in your community because a lot of times your local farmers especially if you live in, in, in southern climates like Texas. I mean, my chickens are out on pasture every day, even the winter. There's grass in the winter here, so we don't, we don't really have to uh, worry about whether or not they're going to be able to graze or, or get so cold that they can't handle the climate. Can gluten cause seizures? Yes, it can. It's, it's actually, Angie, there was, a, there was a show years ago on the, on the show Discovery Medical that the, the feature of the show was a, a young baby 
who had gluten-induced seizures. It was part of their medical mystery series. And we, so we, we've known that for years, but I was really happy to see that mainstream TV actually covered it. Um, let's see. Yeah, Thomas, good point. I, I, I wrote that backwards, didn't I? Thomas says, two times less, do you mean half of? Yes, I do. Um, uh, Chantel says, can my wife, can, Dr. Ken, your wife, teach us how to do organic farming? No. My wife likes her privacy and she does not want to be in the public eye at all. And so I really, I have to respect that about her because she takes care of me. However, uh, over the course of the next year or so, we're going to be doing more um, more farming information for those of you interested. Um, we're, we're just, we've just got to plan it out in such a way where my wife's privacy is kept and that, and that again, she just doesn't, doesn't care to be involved in the, in the main eye of, of everybody. Um, where did you hear the chemo only had three to 5% success rate up to five years? Uh, I don't know where you're getting that particular statistic, but, um, as far as three to five percent success rate, I think largely it depends on the type of cancer in terms of its success rate. And, and some cancers, there's better success rate of chemo um, versus other types of cancers. For example, pancreatic cancer, very, very poor success rate. Um, cancers like sarcoma, soft tissue and, and, and hard cancers, uh, bone cancers, very poor success rate. What, what I've said in the past that you may have heard me say is um, cancers themselves, most cancer institutes report their chemo and their radiation success rates based on two-year survival. To me, a success rate is not did I live or die within two years of getting the treatment. That doesn't indicate success. You really have to follow that person out multiple years, longer than five years. But how do you judge success? Do you judge success by the fact that the tumor shrank or do you judge success by the fact that the person is healthy again and living a healthy life with full functionality? Because I would argue that many chemotherapeutic agents destroy a person's functionality and so therefore destroy their quality of life. And so then that person is better judged and, and can tell you more about it than I could, but is it worth the destruction of quality of life for a minimal success rate? That's a decision that only the person with the cancer can make. Um, Another question, why is it conventional nutrition based on observational and food frequency questionnaire? Because it's run the way much of science today is run. It's run like a sociology versus a scientific. Sociology is a soft science. There's no hard data. It's very subjective. And if you keep food questionnaires um, and, you, and you make observations based on that type of data collection, then what you can do is you can manipulate the numbers and the data to say anything that you want it to say so that you can manipulate the message. But when you go to hard science, nutrition, um, there's a lot of hard science in nutrition that's, that's very, very accurate. It's just that conventional mainstream, for the most part, run by, it's run by the medical system, right? So, I mean, who teaches nutrition. I mean, most of your registered dietitians just get run through a system to learn about macros and how important drugs are, but they don't really learn about nutrition as it relates to, to actually qualifying as, as something that can help with disease, that can help cure disease, that can, that's, that's imperative to overcome disease. Um, they think that calories are the end-all be-all, and that it's just a very unfortunate thing about our modern society. And it, you know, no offense to any of you who are registered dietitians, but I think you would agree with me if you went through that training, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, scroll down on both sides. Let's see. Do you recommend using ghee as lactose-free? Not not unless you know whether or not you're allergic to dairy or not. So, I mean, as far as lactose is concerned, uh, maybe, maybe more. But again, a, the same other rules apply, A2 and organic. And if you're allergic to dairy, I don't recommend it. Yeah, somebody's asking about those American cheese singles not being real dairy. Yeah, they're the furthest thing from actual dairy that you'd want to touch. That stuff is poison. Failed my dairy allergy test, but can eat Greek yogurt mixed with virgin coconut oil. No, nope, don't see a question there. After every... Um, yeah, so the comment there, just somebody saying, after all of this, I think I need to confirm whether or not I'm lactose intolerant. 
Yeah, a lot of you think you have SIBO. Like SIBO and lactose intolerance, the symptoms are super, super close to each other. And remember, SIBO is, is another test where you blow positive on a methane and hydrogen gas type test, just like uh, you can do the same thing with, with lactose intolerance. And so I think for a lot of people, it's important to differentiate that because a lot of people go on and if they're not dairy free, they're still eating dairy. They might be gluten free, but they, then they've been told somewhere by someone that they've had SIBO and now they want to put them on antibiotics and antibiotics destroy the gut microflora and make lactose intolerance even worse for many people. What's the best to rehab bicep tendonitis? Rest. Um, what kind of exercise or therapies? Rest. If you've got bicep tendonitis, it's a tough one because the tendon itself doesn't have a rich blood supply. So if you don't give it adequate rest, you're just going to keep re-injuring it. But as far as supplementation is concerned, I would definitely, um, I would be on high doses, like three to six grams a day of fish oil of a high quality fish oil, something like my Omega Max. Um, you might consider Matrozyme, which is a digestive, it's not a digestive enzyme, it's a proteolytic enzyme that helps to kind of um, increase the blood flow to those areas that don't have tremendous blood flow. You might also consider uh, frequency specific microcurrent as a rehab option as well. And you definitely want to consider vitamin C. You want to consider a very high quality multivitamin that contains the vitamins and the, and the trace minerals very, very important because a lot of times, the ten, you know, tendonitis is those types of tendonitis injury can be overuse injury. A lot of times they are, but a lot of times they're malnutrition coupled with overuse. So person's undernourished. They can't handle the stress or the force of the workout. They tear the tendon or, or have the inflammation in the tendon, and then they just don't ever recover because they don't take enough time off to do it. And they never really address their nutrition. But those are generic things I would, I would do right away. I had my first symptoms of lactose intolerance when I was six years old. That means I had really already had my villi compromised. It depends, Angel. You, you Remember, celiac disease can cause lactose intolerance, but it's not the only thing that can cause that. So were there other factors uh, for you? I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about you or your history, but that would be, you know, that would be a question to ponder. So Michael says, I asked the drug question. So clarity on that drug question earlier, because a lot of veterans come back from war and drink a lot of alcohol and eat unhealthy. And when discharged, some of us end up homeless and on street drugs like Coke. Yeah, it's a sad, sad situation. I, 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 I agree. I mean, the veterans deserve more. I, I'm a veteran myself. And so I, 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 I've seen that, especially when I worked in the VA hospital in rheumatology. It was a tragic thing what they were doing to a lot of those veterans, even in the hospital setting, not even necessarily with illicit street drugs, but with actual prescription drugs. Um, yeah, I wish veterans would have had better access to better care, meaningful care. The, the VA system, in my opinion, is wrecked. It, it just, you know, there's very few in that system that understand, you know, how to take care of people. And really, outside of drugs, outside of giving drugs, they don't really have any, any unfortunately, they don't really have any solutions. Um, can I explain the rule of thirds for food on a plate? I can figure out protein, but not fats and carbs. I mean, it, there's no there's no magic configuration here, and it's you understand when I, when I talk about the rule of thirds, it's not you better have a third, a third, a third every time, or you're gonna you know you're gonna fail. It's basically if we look at your total calories in a day, and we split that out. A third of your calories should come from carbs, a third from fat, and a third from protein. And so what that might look like is, you remember that a carb, one gram equals four calories, one gram of protein equals four calories, and one gram of fat equals nine calories. So fat is a lot more caloric than carb or protein. So you gotta do your percentages accurate. So if, if, you know, for example, if you're eating a thousand calories, we'll just keep it simple, then approximately 333 calories should be from carb, right? So you divide that by four, and that's how many grams, right? Same thing down here, 333, divide that by nine, and that's how many grams. Same thing here, 333, divide that by four, and that's how many grams. So if you're trying to figure out how many grams of each of these that you should do, if you're counting your macros, that's one way to go about trying to solve that and figure that, that piece out. But that's, that's the general rule. Now, 
Again, don't strain yourself to be perfect at 33, 33, 33. If one day you're 40%, 30, 30, and the next day you're you know, 35 and, and 30 here and, and, um, and 35 in the, in the protein area or the, or the fat area, it's not, that's not going to make or break you. You're, you're shooting for a relative equality amongst macronutrients in your diet on a, on a regular basis. Remember, life is about balance, and a lot of people lose that balance when they go too hard, too far in one direction. We saw it with low-fat diets in the 80s and 90s. We see it, we're seeing some of it. You know, a lot of you are keto, and a lot of people preach keto as the solution. But you know, my clinic, I see people that have ketoed for too long, and they've taken it too far, and then they're they're pushing their body to imbalance in a different way. Keto was the initially was the solution for a high-carb diet. But you can, you can take any of these diets too far. The body likes balance, and the body likes to be able to have access to carbs, fats, and proteins. They're, they're all three required, um, for, for in my opinion, for solid nutrition over the long haul. Again, you can, you can do short terms with restrictions, but you know, the body likes, in the longevity of things, the body likes balance. Can colostrum help with building oral tolerance? I, no, I think what helps build oral tolerance isn't taking colostrum a, as an agent to help bind things that you might be allergic to in your GI tract. I think what helps with oral tolerance is figuring out why you have it, why you have oral intolerance. And for most people, categorically speaking, there's four big reasons why you can develop food allergy. One is you're eating foods you're allergic to and that won't go away. Two, um, you're eating things within the food that are stimulating your immune system and over exciting it so you develop or acquire allergies to it and you have to figure out what those things are. Number three, you've got microbiome imbalances. Number four, you've got nutritional deficiencies. And really number five, you've got chemicals that you're being exposed to, whether those are coming through your food or whether they're coming through the environment, but all those things can damage oral tolerance. We see that a lot with mold victims. People in chronic mold develop allergies to everything and their, and their diet just dwindles and gets smaller and smaller and smaller because they lose oral tolerance to almost everything over time the longer they're in the mold. So April O says, uh, April Joe rather says, was gluten yesterday feeling like death today, all day heating bad and bad, Tylenol, nothing else I can do. Go back April Joe while you're in bed and watch my show on how to recover from gluten exposure. If we could put that link up in the, in the uh, Facebook feed for, for April Joe, hopefully that'll help her out. How do you make pumpkin pie without dairy? Um, largely with coconut milk or coconut cream. So if you don't like coconut, I mean, some people use other like other dairy um, substitutes like almond or hemp milks. Um, but that that's generally how you do it. That's generally the way that you would do it. So so you know if you're trying to eat pumpkin pie over the holidays, that you might want to try some different recipes using some of those others. Can you also do it? Can you do a crash course on boron? I can. We're, we've got lots more crash courses nutritionally coming in 2022 for all of you. Uh, how can you test milk allergy versus intolerance? Angel's asking. So I mean, you know, blood work is 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 one of the ways to do that. Versus intolerance. Intolerance is generally the way you test that is through a you know through a breath test, through a hydrogen gas breath test. Can lactose affect B vitamins as I'm excessive in B6 up to 700 nanomoles per liter? Um, reading where normal is 35, to, I'm not taking any B supplements. Yeah, I would, I would get your levels rechecked. That might just be a lab error. I see that a lot, Anthony. And so, you know, labs sometimes make mistakes where, where you know, there's a decimal off or, or there's something off. And so I would have it rechecked just to be certain that you didn't get a false elevation of B6, because if you're not supplementing with B6 and your levels are that high, that would be my first suspicion. You know, there's really not a genetic situation where B6 generally tends to run that high. Thoughts on silicon dioxide and vitamins can cause cancer? No, that's not ever been shown or ever been proven. Silicone is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. I just, I think that somebody somewhere is probably overinflating that um, into something that they shouldn't be. How long does it take for your sense of smell to come back from, from the disease that shall not be named? 
Everybody's a little different. There's three things that you can do, Peter. I would say number one, zinc. Um, higher levels of zinc. Number two, high levels of quercetin to help get the zinc in because that loss of taste and smell generally is linked to COVID-induced um, zinc deficit. You, when you have a viral infection, you use more zinc to, for your body, use more zinc to try to combat it, but zinc is necessary for taste and smell. So a lot of people end up on the floor with zinc post-infection. So zinc and quercetin and then the other thing is train your olfactory by, you can use essential oils. I, I really like peppermint or a mint-based essential oil, breathing that in several minutes over the course of the day to try to train your olfactory to activate and turn back on. But I, I see in some cases where we, get it, we can get it back in a person. I mean, I had one person tell me in three days, to zinc and quercetin and did it. And I've had other people take it for several months before it actually was restored. So there's this window of differential amongst different individuals in my experience. Um, let's see here. Let's see, go down on, on uh, that side, yeah. Spring water or distilled water on a gluten-free diet? Either one spring or distilled just clean water clean filtered water is what you need remember your body's 68 percent water somewhere in that neighborhood in order to heal you got to have water that's not poisoning you so um, as long as it's clean and filtered you're, you should be okay uh, let's see here down a little bit more or did I miss that one? Yeah, the sense of taste. So somebody was talking about got my smell back, but still don't have a great sense of taste. The taste will come back later. Taste comes back. Remember that most of what you can taste is your sense of smell, but taste comes back last. Uh, alkaline water, what's my opinion of it? I'm not a big fan of spending thousands of dollars on alkaline water machines. What I am a big fan of is drinking real water that's filtered and eating a lot of good, healthy, real foods that are alkalinizing in nature. Remember, most of the, the vegetables that you eat predominantly are alkalinizing and most of what they're made of is water. So, you know, I've seen people take alkalinization of their water way too far and they, they create a situation where their pH starts to shift in, into a too alkaline of an environment. Remember, you want your gut to be acidic. Every aspect of your gut is acidic. Your mouth is slightly acidic. Your stomach is very acidic. Your GI tract, your small and large intestines are acidic. They're not supposed to be alkaline. Dowsing these with massive quantities of alkaline water on a daily basis can disrupt the pH and can disrupt your capacity to digest your food. I just don't suggest that you, um, that you look at alkaline water as a necessity for function and, 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 um, and life and also consider the possibility that it can damage your digestion. What time is it? We're, yeah, I think we're, we're pretty well at time. So. Yeah, I think I got almost all. There may be a few more straggling questions. If I missed yours, you know, I apologize. We had we had quite a few coming in, and it was hard to keep up with a lot with a lot of them. But hey, look, come back and join me next week if you want that question answered. And I didn't get to it. Make sure you come back next week and enter it in first, uh, and and ask it again next week. If if um, you're new to the Dr. Osborne show, you want to come and visit me at glutenfreesociety.org and sign up for our newsletter there. That's how we send you information when the show goes live. That's how we update you about what's coming down the pipeline. So um, that's also where we're going to be going very, very soon. We're, we're actually moving our platform over to there. So if you want to be able to ask me questions and interact, you need to come to that platform. So I would just encourage you to get used to coming over there. You'll learn a lot over there anyway. Um, we're just tired of the censorship, and we want to be able to speak more freely than what we've been able to. Um, since the disease that shall not be named has taken over everyone's lives. So, look, I wish you a fantastic week. I hope you learned something tonight. If you did, I did my job. And look, if this is helpful for you, it's probably helpful for someone else. Don't forget our core mission. Hashtag save 100 million lives. If you found it helpful, if you found some of the information I've given to you over time life-changing, don't be stingy with it. Share it. We got to get to the world. We got to get, we got to reach that 100 million um, that's the goal. That's our core mission. So make me proud and make me um, 
share that information so that I can reach that goal. You help me and I help you. That's the deal. So anyway, hope you have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.